to PA Centered, a podcast designed to help listeners be a part of the solution to end sexual harassment, abuse, and assault. Each episode, we will take on a topic or current event to help spark conversation and break down barriers to building communities free from sexual violence. Hi, I'm Jackie Strom. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the Prevention and Resource Coordinator at the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. I'll be your host today as we're joined by a few guests who can tell us more about the role of children's advocacy centers. We'll hear all about what a child medical exam is actually like and how it can benefit survivors and their families. We have three experts joining us today. Chris Kirkner is the Executive Director at the Children's Advocacy Centers of Pennsylvania. Dr. Narelle Atkinson is the Section Chief of the Child Protection Program at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. And Lauren Gunther is the Director of Sexual Assault Services at Delaware County Victim Assistance Center. Welcome, Chris, Narell, and Lauren. Thank you for having us. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So one thing that we all have in common is wanting to keep kids safe from abuse. And unfortunately, we know that at least one in 10 children will experience physical or sexual abuse before their 18th birthday. The good news is that Children's Advocacy Centers, or CACs, provide a child-focused response to abuse cases. So to help us learn more, Chris, can you start by telling us what a Child Advocacy Center is and what they do? Certainly. Thank you for this opportunity. Children's Advocacy Centers were founded about 30 years ago to improve the way, at first, that child sexual abuse cases were handled in our communities. Um, They were designed to coordinate the response among law enforcement, child welfare, prosecution, medical, and mental health providers to ensure that children were not re-traumatized by the systems that were designed to help them. And the model has evolved over the years, and it includes um, various components. And the first component is a multidisciplinary team response. So all of those professionals that I just referenced will be working together out of usually a a child-friendly, specially designed facility to coordinate their investigations. Um, So we wanna make sure that kids have a safe place to go to talk about what happened to them. Um, The child is questioned by a specially trained forensic interviewer whose sole job it is, is to talk with children about allegations of both sexual abuse and serious physical abuse are seen Um, at most of our children's advocacy centers. Uh, Team members watch, um, usually on a recording, uh, watch a recording from another room or through a mirror, a one-way mirror. And the team works very collaboratively throughout that process. They talk about the allegations in advance, they observe the interview, and then they meet afterward to decide what those next steps might be. And then while the child's being interviewed, the caregiver is meeting with a victim advocate someone who can explain the entire process to them, make sure they have all the names and contact information of the various team members who are there investigating their child's case. Um, And the victim advocate also provides support to the the caregiver. Um, Sometimes caregivers are are anxious or or fearful and advocates are there to support them and also to forward to follow those cases through the entire system. So if a case does go to prosecution um, or a child needs to get a medical exam, those victim advocates are there to make sure those referrals are made and even to go and provide accompaniment if necessary. Um, So we have the the team working together, the child-friendly and welcoming facility, the specialized forensic interview, victim support services, and then a very critical part of that response is the medical exam, which we're here obviously to talk about today. Um, And children's advocacy centers are required to offer specialized medical evaluation and treatment that needs to be made available to all children and coordinated as part of that MDT response. Um, So the multidisciplinary team and the medical practitioner will work together in CACs to prioritize screening criteria and to create protocols and policies to ensure that children um, have access to medical exams. Um, And medical exams need to be conducted by qualified physicians, Um, There needs to be a mechanism for peer review. Um, We also have seen nurses um, doing exams at our CACs. 
And some of those um, services are available by the CAC or, or sponsored by the CAC, they're on site, and some of them are off site through a linkage agreement. But the key is that um, the exam be provided by someone with specialized training who is working with MDT to create those protocols and to share information throughout the life of the investigation. And then all of the MDT members are trained regarding the purpose of the medical exam um, and the Children's Advocacy Center staff are trained to educate the caregivers about the purpose of the medical exam and what to expect. And then we also ask that medical providers share the results of their exams and their evaluations to the mandated agencies that are on the multidisciplinary team so that there is constant communication about what, what the findings are and what the next steps might be. And then um, if a child needs follow-up services as a result of their medical exam, um, we'll work, the CAC will work to make sure that that child has access to those follow-up services, ideally with the same provider that they saw, but maybe not. Maybe at the medical exam, we find something, something um, unrelated to the abuse that needs to be taken care of. Um, but the medical exam is a vital part of the CAC response. And we wanna make sure that every child has access to that, regardless of ability to pay. Um, though, those services should be offered free of charge um, or, or charge to insurance if possible. Um, so again, the medical exam is a really important part of that evaluation. And then there's also um, CECs are responsible for ensuring that children receive mental health services. So while the child is at the CEC, there might be an assessment, a trauma assessment, and then CECs either have mental health services on site or they link children to services in the community, often um, rape crisis agencies, and they'll partner with them to get them mental health services in a timely manner. And so we've got the team, we've got forensic interviewing, victim services, medical evaluations, mental health, and then, and then the CAC oversees case review and case tracking. So we wanna make sure that children get everything they need. So we track those cases and we also review those cases. So periodically all members of the team, including the medical practitioner, will come together to evaluate, did this child get everything they needed? What are we, you know, what are the next steps for this family? What else might they need? And that's part of that. And all of this is done in a culturally competent manner, taking into consideration all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. There is training available for MDT members and CAC staff on those issues so that they are prioritized. And then some CACs are private nonprofits and others are, others are government-based agencies or part of, of one of the nonprofits. We have 41 children's advocacy centers across the state of Pennsylvania. We still have quite a few counties that don't have um, children's advocacy centers and we're working to help them develop a collaborative response. Sometimes it's challenging when you're in a smaller rural community without a lot of resources. And so we just wanna make sure that every child across the state has access to a children's advocacy center if they need it. So we're working on that. And we also work very closely with our rape crisis agencies across the state. In some counties, the rape crisis agency provides the victim support services and helps us connect our, our kids with resources throughout the community and as well provides mental health services for which, you know, which is, which is of course very helpful. Thanks, Chris, for that really awesome overview. And so I want to turn our attention to Lauren as someone who works at a local rape crisis center. I'm wondering if you could share with us why you think it's important for rape crisis centers and CACs to work together. And maybe you could even talk about some of the benefits for child victims and their families when rape crisis centers and CACs do collaborate. Absolutely. So collaboration is incredibly important uh, to make sure that child victims and their families are receiving the best possible services. Uh, for one, it ensures that all the needs of the victim and the family are being addressed. Both child advocacy centers and rape crisis centers do have some overlapping services, those that Chris kind of touched on that are separate from their CAC, but there are also services that are unique to each. So every victim deserves to have all access to the services available to them. And having that communication and collaboration also prevents the duplication of those services where there is the two separate agencies. There's a clear established plan uh, that's developed between the two agencies 
that will assist the victim throughout. Having that communication and collaboration also prevents the duplication of services uh, for those times that the CAC and the Rape Crisis Center are two separate agencies. So having a clear established plan of what each agency will do to assist that victim is really beneficial. It also ensures that the consistency in messaging is the same. Uh, we all know the entire process can be incredibly confusing for families to navigate. Uh, so making sure that all professionals are relaying the information the same is incredibly beneficial to the family. So I would love for us to take some time to focus on the medical exam itself. So first, Narelle, why is it important for kids who have experienced abuse to have a medical exam? So I think first, just to start, I just want to explain who I am because um, child abuse pediatrics is not a field that is known to many. So I am a pediatrician, but I have specialty training in child abuse evaluations. And so I spent an extra three years learning how to do appropriate evaluations on children who have experienced all types of maltreatment. So as pediatricians, when a child makes a disclosure of abuse or more specifically sexual abuse, we recommend as pediatricians that they should have a medical examination done by someone that is um, competent in recognizing findings that may be normal or abnormal, someone who is able to address the specific concerns surrounding abuse, and someone who can provide care for that child moving forward after they have made their disclosure. What is most important when a child does come for a medical evaluation is for us to be able to tell them that their bodies are healthy, that we are able to, um, if there are abnormalities, which is not something that we commonly see, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but for us to be able to, if we do find abnormalities, to explain that to the child or to the caretaker, if we don't find abnormalities, when some parents may expect that you should be finding an abnormality in the setting of a abuse disclosure, we're able to explain that to the parent or the child as well. But I think most importantly, we want to reassure the child that their body is safe, their body is healthy, that no one can tell just by looking at this child that they have been abused. And I think we have, we have seen um, often children conceptualize things about their body because things have happened to them. So young children may carry worries or fears about how their body looks to others. They might be worried they have infections. And so we provide a safe space for a child to ask those questions and for them to get honest answers and for them to feel comfortable addressing whatever concerns they have. We are testing for infections. We are looking for other medical issues or concerns that have not been addressed in the child. And then finally, we work very closely with the investigative agencies, as Chris had mentioned earlier. So we help to communicate the findings, the significance of findings, the significance of lack of findings. But we're part of that multidisciplinary collaborative. Um, we're a piece of that collaborative. And we're there in the instance that these cases go to court, we're able to explain the findings or lack of findings in the setting of a abuse disclosure. So I think overall, the medical exam is designed to make sure that the child is safe and healthy. And, and again, to make sure that we're communicating with our multidisciplinary partners so that we are there for that piece of the investigation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Narelle. So Lauren, in your experience, what have been some of the reasons that parents or guardians or even older children might not pursue a medical exam after being victimized? Sure. So there are many reasons uh, that parents or guardians may be hesitant to get their child examined. And the basis for, for this hesitancy is, is usually just a lack of understanding about what this type of exam entails. And this lack of understanding really contributes to these myths that we hear about these medical exams uh, for sexual abuse. One of the most common myths I hear from parents or guardians is a major concern that the exam is invasive or maybe painful to the child. Um, I've talked with parents who have referenced things that they've heard, uh, things they've seen on TV, or often make their own inferences based off of their knowledge of medical exams or gynecological exams and what they look like. Um, so this can be 
very scary for a parent to knowingly put their child in that environment to put their child um, through this exam and what they think will take place. Another reason is sometimes the nature of the sexual abuse um, itself can have a parent wondering if it's necessary to get their child examined. If there's no disclosed penetration, they often wonder like, is there a need for the exam? Uh, if the child has already been seen by their primary pediatrician, then why the need for another individual to examine their child? Um, and lastly, just the whole process in general for parents. They might also be meeting with police, uh, forensic interviewers, other advocates, um, and sometimes worrying about maybe the cost of, a, of the exam or the financial burden of having to take off work for these appointments. So until a parent really understands the importance or the purpose of the medical exam, exam by a trained doctor, that it can really contribute to their reluctance. Yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I, this is Kristen. I completely agree with Lauren. And when I worked at the Children's Advocacy Center in Philadelphia, I found that this combination of, of concerns, you know, it, the, the exam is going to be invasive. Well, my child didn't disclose penetration. So why, why should we do it? That was a common, that was a common theme that, that parents felt that they really didn't want to subject their child to that medical exam. But what we learned from watching doctors like Norell in action is that it's, you know, it's not invasive and it is a very supportive process that brings, brings some relief, brings, brings a lot of relief to kids and families. Um, even if there are some findings, which are unusual, but there, there are some cases with findings, the fact that they're getting treatment and support for a medical issue from a specialist and you know, again, we definitely, uh, I echo everything that Lauren said in terms of concerns that, um, that caregivers have, but yet so often I see that, that medical evaluation as just the, the time that the process that, that is very supportive of caregivers and, and their children, and they feel, they feel much better after it. Yeah. And I think just to add in to both Chris and to Lauren, and I think particularly kind of, I think addressing the, the three things that Lauren was talking about, that the exam is invasive or that it's, it's going to be re-traumatizing to the child. And, you know, it is not that at all. It's, um, it's I think a lot of times caretakers conceptualize the exam as it being the equivalent as to when they go to see a gynecologist, but we're not gynecologists, we're pediatricians. And um, this is a specialized evaluation, but it's a completely external exam. So it means that we're not sticking anything up to up the child. The examination should not be painful to the child. It might feel different, but it's not anything that hurts or is meant to put that child in more discomfort. Um, I always say as well that the child is in control of this part of the evaluation. I never um, and similarly, other child abuse pediatricians would never force a child into doing an examination if they're not comfortable doing it or they're not comfortable doing it that day in particular. We, we work with the child just to make sure that we're allowing them to have some control in this, in this process. Just in terms of the piece, in terms of if there's penetration or not, if a child has not made a disclosure of penetration, um, I, I think what we do know is sometimes children disclose things in pieces, so they may initially provide a little bit of information that might not have indicated that there was penetration, but later on that child may disclose additional information. Sometimes during the course of the medical evaluation, there are findings and a small percentage of kids we can find findings which may um, support a, a disclosure of penetration when that had not initially been made by the child. But, you know, I, I think it's important not just to, I, to look for are there injuries, but we also want to make sure are there any infections that a child may have that could have been from the abuse. And so that is part of the evaluation. And then we spend a, a good hour or more with, with each child and family. So um, it's a really dedicated time for us to be able to sit and talk with the child about their concerns, to talk with the, the parent about um, any concerns they have, to make sure that their therapeutic resources that are in place for the child. 
again, we're a specialty. This is a specialized exam. Um, and we take all the time to make sure that the child is comfortable during this process. Thank you all. Yeah, I know there, as you just explained, there are lots of myths around these medical exams. So I guess, Narelle, is there anything else you wanted to share about the exams that we haven't already talked about that would help people feel more comfortable going through with them or making that choice? So I think people have probably been hearing throughout this podcast that it's rare that we have findings. And I think that goes against what a lot of people think, that if a child has been sexually abused, then there should be physical evidence of that abuse. But what we know is that there's only a very small percentage of children who actually have abnormal findings, such as injuries or infections. Um, We say upwards of 90% of children will have normal exams. We don't use this exam to prove or disprove the child's disclosure. Again, this examination is done to ensure that the child is healthy. I think we all know that there's many inappropriate things that can be done to a child that are considered abuse, which would not leave a mark or an injury to the child. And so, you know, I I think what we often tell parents is, your child's not here for us to say whether or not what they disclose is true. We're here to make sure that your child is healthy. And another piece of this is that we also educate our multidisciplinary partners. So Child Protective Services or detectives assigned to these cases, we explain why it's normal for children to not have findings in the setting of a disclosure that they've made. Um, And this can be very important for court or the investigative um, process. So I think that's probably the biggest one. It it can be something difficult for a parent to wrap their head around because often they're wanting answers as to what has happened to their child and, and you might not be able to definitively say what has happened, but it can be very reassuring, I think, to a parent and to a child to know that despite what has happened to their child, um, that they are safe and, and that they look like every other child who is their age. So with regards to the timeline, does it matter how recent the abuse was in order for a child to get an exam? Yeah, that's, a, it, that's actually a really good question because we certainly manage these cases differently when it's something that is recent versus something that might be a month or two months old, or whether it's a kid who may be having symptoms uh, that would make us concerned that there's something else going on with the child, such as an infection or injury, things of that sort. But generally we sort of classify these into two, two buckets. I think the first one is what we would call an acute evaluation. Here in the state of Pennsylvania, that would be a child who has made a disclosure of abuse of something that's happened within 72 hours or three days. And that's optimal time for a kid to have evidence collection kits done on them so that we can potentially obtain DNA evidence, which help, which can be helpful in these cases. So an event of an acute assault, we have opportunities to take DNA collection to test for sexually transmitted infections to provide medication that can be used to prevent infections in a child. This timeframe can be a little bit more broad in some states or some states that work up to 120 hours or five days after that event. And we would also say that any child who's having symptoms or they having bleeding or discharge or pain and they've made a disclosure or a child who may be having thoughts of harming themselves, these are all kids which we would want them to be seen more quickly in an emergency setting. If that has happened beyond the 72 hour period and the child is otherwise stable, then that's a child that we would schedule at our child advocacy center to have a um, full medical examination. Great, thank you. So to kind of wrap us up, Chris, if an adult suspects that a child has been abused, what is the best way for them to get help? You know, the the primary way I think is to report to Childline, Pennsylvania's Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-932-0313. And they can also report to their local police or call 911. At the Children's Advocacy Centers, you know, sometimes cases originate with a Childline report and then Childline will cross report to police and vice versa. Sometimes they originate with a police report 
and then that goes to child line. There are some cases you know, that child line won't take if the alleged perpetrator doesn't meet the definition for child line, a family member or, or caregiver, but I, I still think child line is, is the way to go. And if it doesn't meet their definition, they, they might instruct the parent or the reporter to, to call their, their police department. And then as Norell said, if the abuse happened within 72 hours, most parents don't know, most caregivers don't know to take their child to the hospital, but the child welfare staff, as well as law enforcement would know that and would hopefully know the best resource in their community to take that child to if the report comes in 72 hours or less of the abuse having happened. Each, each, um, each county is a little bit different in terms of how the, how the cases flow, and it sometimes depends who's providing the medical and where that medical. Is it on site at the center? Is it at a hot local hospital, ER? We try to keep kids out of the ER if at all possible, but that does have to happen sometimes. Lauren, is there anything that you wanted to add about what this kind of collaboration looks like um, or, or how people could reach out to your center or some of the other centers in Pennsylvania um, to receive help? Yeah, um, I, I agree. I definitely think it varies county to county. I know here in Delaware County, we receive our referrals from all different resources, police, hospitals, medical providers here in the county. Um, as well as the the Children's Advocacy Center. Uh, So I would always just encourage anyone who is looking for information or kind of what the next step to do is to just reach out to their local center. Um, And I know that you can find it on PCAR's website. Can I just jump in? Um, uh, CACs of Pennsylvania also has a website, PENCAC, P-E-N-N-C-A-C dot org. And there's a map on there so you can find your local children's advocacy center. I also wanted to add, um, you know, we talked about how CACs and rape crisis agencies can work together. And one of the things that I think we're starting to do more of is just collaborate around raising awareness of the issue um, and uh, trying to help elevate the issue of child, child sexual abuse specifically in our communities so that we have all of the resources we need, whether it's the rape crisis agency, the CAC, um, or some other mental health agency, perhaps, so that when kids do report, they get everything that they need in a timely manner, and they don't have to, for example, sit on a wait list for therapy. So I think CACs and rape crisis agencies can really, in partnership, just um, kind of magnify the messaging about the scope and depth of the problem, but also the resources that are available. That's awesome. And one of the reasons we're having this podcast, we definitely want our rape crisis centers and others to know about the great resources that children's advocacy centers um, and folks like Norell can provide um, to make that experience, you know, as least traumatic as possible and really make sure that we're meeting all of the kids and families needs if, if they're in that situation. So I just want to say thank you so much, Chris, Norell, and Lauren, for joining us to talk about child advocacy centers and the medical exam process. Hopefully this really does help more families and survivors feel comfortable reaching out to get the help that they need if abuse occurs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that's all the time we have today, but thanks for listening to this episode of PA Centered. You can learn more by visiting the links in the episode description. And to report suspected child abuse in Pennsylvania, call Childline at 1-800-932-0313. If you or a loved one needs help, a local sexual assault center is available 24-7. Call 1-888-772-7227 for more information or find your local center online at pcar.org. Together, we can end sexual violence. Any views or opinions expressed on PA Centered by staff or their guests are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of PCAR or PCAR's funders.